your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. That will be our lesson for this morning, our lesson text. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 11. 1 and 2 Peter in Jude were written during a time of persecution against God's people. Not only was there persecution taking place during that time period, but there are also false teachers who were active in trying to pull the Lord's people away from the faith that they had been obedient to to become Christians. There will always be someone <clears throat> speaking against us or trying to tell us things that are not true. We'll always suffer some form or some level of persecution. When I used to read 2 Peter chapter 1, I used to think that, that this text was written to new Christians, but it really wasn't. It was written to people who were already Christians, and yet there was a reminder to, to these people to be faithful in light of the persecution and some of the errors that would have been being taught. Notice verse 12 in 2 Peter 1. Peter says, I'll, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. I cannot help but think that, and he says, though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you, these were Christian people. But at the same time, there is always the challenge to become unfaithful or to give up. When I was studying for this particular lesson, I came to a conclusion that these are not seven graces or virtues, but as one particular commentator I studied said, these were actually fruits of faith. Let's look at the background of the statements that Peter made in verses 5 through 11. As you move back to the beginning of the chapter, where Simon Peter says he is a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, we all got our faith from the same source. As one translation says, like precious faith. Any faith that's biblical, any faith that we have is going to be based upon the Word of God. And we all should have the same convictions and the same teaching and the same results from that teaching. Peter reminds them and establishes that. But he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It was important for them to understand the need to multiply their knowledge of grace, their knowledge of God, and multiply their knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he establishes the fact, saying, Seeing that his divine power has granted or given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. There's not a thing that we need as Christians that has not been delivered to us from God. There's not a thing that they needed to be faithful and to be strong under the hands of persecution or words of false teachers that they were lacking. Everything they needed had been given to them and God had made it available to them. Now, through these things that had been given, Peter says, for by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. These people, many had not been Christians at all, and they had been ungodly people. They had lived as worldly people. But because of their teaching, they escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter, Peter probably preached mostly to a Jewish audience. The application could apply to many. Did you know that most of the persecution against the early church was Jew upon Jew? The unfaithful Jew who had not converted to Christ would, would attack and persecute the Jew who had become a Christian. Do you remember what Peter said in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 to, for those people who heard his preaching on Pentecost that day? Save yourselves from this perverse generation. 
Well, he wasn't talking about the Gentiles. He was talking about the perverse Jews that lived that were in the culture where those Jews lived that Peter was preaching to. However, we all come from a background of one sort or another. And one of the things I learned from this that in the world there is corruption and it exists through lusts. That is through evil desires on the part of man to fulfill the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind, and to do anything that would satisfy an individual in his or her own wishes or desires. But they are corrupt if they didn't come from God. Now Peter is speaking to these people. He says, and for the... He says, and for this very reason also, applying all diligence. In your faith, supply moral excellence or virtue. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Let's look at these fruits for a few minutes this morning in light of the context from which they came. Where Peter presented to these people who were being persecuted. Where they were being challenged by false teachers. The most important thing you can add to your faith early on is moral excellence. Faith is not a virtue. It's a conviction. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 would tell us. It's that which we believe, and we believe because we hear God's word. As faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But Peter here says, your faith, your convictions, the things that you understand, that you have learned thus far, that which you know already, you add to that virtue or moral excellence because they lived in a corrupt world he reminded them you came out of a world that was filled with lust peter told the people on pentecost you live among a perverse generation do we not live among a perverse generation today that has the capability and the probability with some to corrupt us oh absolutely and one of the things that's important if you're, if you're going to add to your faith, the Holy Spirit gave these things to Peter to write down. As a matter of fact, he reminds them in verse 21 of the next chapter that the Holy Spirit has provided the information to the prophets of the past, and obviously he would include himself as an apostle. The Holy Spirit gave us these things, and he gave us these things in a specific order. Peter didn't just randomly pick these out and say, well, let's put this first. The Holy Spirit guided him in what to say. There's a need for the Christian to have a life of moral excellence in your speech, in your dress, in the convictions that you have about what is right and what is wrong. To have a moral mindset that is in line with the will of God. And it was important for them to understand that when they, as they were going to live among people in the world, they could not live like the people of the world. Would Paul not remind Christians to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord? And in this time of persecution and challenge, it would have been easy to compromise a little bit. You know, you compromise a little bit. If you're not careful, you compromise a lot in your moral ideas, in your moral thoughts. We have a lot of moral debates going on today. Without listing all those things because of time constraints, it's important that we check to see what God has to say about what is moral, what is immoral. Paul enumerates things in Galatians 5, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, he enumerates certain things that, that we can look at that are immoral. But the first thing to do is purge out the immoral things of your life and have a life of moral excellence. Not only in your moral excellence, adding to your faith moral excellence, but also knowledge. Knowledge. I know a lot of people who think they know things. I'm going to say something. When it comes to spiritual matters, 
I don't know anything in and of myself. All I know is what God said. And the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. The psalmist would tell us in Psalm 119 verse 104, through your precepts I get or gain understanding. God's word, God's teaching, God's precepts, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. In order to combat then the false teachers, these Christians needed to be filling their hearts and minds with the knowledge of the ways of God. In that particular time, and especially among the Jewish people, it was important for them to have, a, have to grow, and not only to grow, but to grow a great deal, to be multiplying their knowledge of God. It was important for them. Is it important for us today to have a good knowledge of who God is? Is it important for them? Was it important for them in that day and time, being Jews among unbelieving Jews, to have a clear understanding as to who Jesus really was? Well, of course it was. There was a that was a constant battle between believing and unbelieving Jews about who Jesus was. Well, not only were they to know who he was, but they were to have multiply their knowledge of Christ. It's not enough to simply know that he's the Son of God, but it's important that he become your Lord. In Luke 6, 46, did Jesus not say, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Who was really the Lord of their lives? And to grow in deeper knowledge. I would think it would be enjoyable as a Jew at that time to take my Old Testament and look at all the prophecies of Jesus and draw certain conclusions and compare those to what I knew as a Jew from the first century as to what Jesus was like in all those ways. Now there were one or two things that could be done with that information. It could, well maybe three. One could be said, well it's okay but it's not okay for me uh, so that's not true. A lot of Jews didn't believe it was true or it's true, but it's not true just because of facts. It's true because they needed Him. Not only was to mul they multiply their knowledge of God and Jesus the Lord, but to multiply their knowledge. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the prophet would say, speaking for God, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's very easy for people today to be destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. If we don't have time to understand God's will, the devil has time to tell us something that's not true. We must take the time to understand and understand some of the major issues. They would have to know some of the major arguments and issues that were taking place at that time that would be thrown at them from one side and the other. And his brother Tony was telling me this morning about a situation. I assume that that discussion he was telling me about could have escalated into something a little more detailed. And a lot of discussion could have taken place. And he can tell you more about that later. But there always is somebody out there with an error to share with you. You and I can't know what's right and what's wrong if we don't know what truth is. To then to grow in their, add to your faith moral excellence, not only that, but add to your faith knowledge, especially at that time of God and of Jesus. And for us today, the same and for the church and worship and all the things that we need to know to be strong. Not only did they need to add to their faith moral excellence and the knowledge, they were also to add to themselves self-control. It is so easy to lose self-control. You don't like what somebody said to you about your Christianity. And you answer. But you don't answer with self control. You answer in the same way they may have attacked you. They needed self-control in their answers. 
They needed self-control if persecution were coming. Do you think that Jesus needed to exercise self-control when he was being arrested in the garden? Peter didn't. Peter draws his sword and Jesus says, put that away. That's what you want to live by. That's what you'll die by. Jesus practiced self-control. What about a time of a corrupt world? Do we need to practice self-control? You know what the hardest thing is to say to yourself at times? It's a two-letter word, and it's easy to remember, and it's N-O. It's hard to tell ourselves no. There's some things that are easy for me to tell myself no to. I have certain food allergies. And if I eat certain foods, I'm going to suffer the consequences of that. And I don't have trouble telling myself no to those things because I know it will make me sick. And there's some things that I don't really care too much about. That they don't, they don't draw my attention. I don't have trouble saying no to those things. Oh, but you start listing those things that we may like that may be very much indeed against the will of God. You have to say no to those things too. Because they lived in a corrupt world. They had come out of corruption. Obviously, they would still struggle with some of their past sins. You escaped the, the world of, the, of corruption. You escaped that corrupt world. And it's controlled by lust. Self-control then, you can't give in to your lust, as Peter would write to these people, your inordinate desires. Because if you do, what's going to happen to your faith? You add to your faith moral excellence and to knowledge, and then you add to knowledge self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit did not lay these out in some uncertain order. There's a purpose for this order, and I want you to think about it for just a moment. There are times that you know that you may have been tempted, as we say, to throw in the towel, to just quit. It may be just for an instant. And don't tell me you've never thought that, because I know you've at least thought about it for an instant, and you come back to your right mind very quickly. But people who struggle, if you struggle with moral excellence, if you struggle with knowledge, and you struggle with self-control, you will not persevere. There's an order to this. But a person who has worked on his or her moral issues, who is building and gaining knowledge, and is saying no to himself or herself regularly, perseverance comes along, don't quit. That's what we would say in modern language, isn't it? Don't quit. You know why a lot of people become unfaithful to God? They'll become Christians and they'll be baptized and, 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 and they will struggle with their old sins and they say, I don't want to do that, I don't want to say that, I don't want to be that. And, and they start studying their Bibles and, and then they say, well, I know I'm struggling, but I'm gonna, I'm, I've got this, I'm controlling this, but they don't keep it up. Perseverance begins push. Our King James Bible says patience. The idea is to persevere, to keep going, not to quit, not to stop. And that may be, that may be the toughest point in the middle of this. I believe everything has a, an apex to it. Once you reach a certain level, the next level is a little easier. But if you leave out any, the next level will never be reached. So you add your faith moral excellence to knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we learn that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' <coughs> doctrine and in fellowship, breaking bread and in the prayers. They did. You think some of those people may have failed to persevere? Well, sure, they did. That's why we have the letter to the Hebrews. But what about those that kept going? 
What about those who continued and would not give up? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to show you something that the writer gave to them that, that would really be encouraging as they reach a certain point where, well, I'm either going to go or stop. I'm kind of at that point. I'm either at the point where I'm, I'm going to, to stop or I'm going to quit. Beginning with verse 36. Those who were struggling to keep going, the writer says, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done all the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Yet, for yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Look at verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. You see what happens, brothers and sisters, this is not just a matter of Roger accomplishing some goals. All oh, my faith is good and, and, and I'm cleaning out my life and, and I'm studying my Bible and, 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 and I'm, I'm gaining this knowledge and, 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 I'm, and I'm getting more self-control all the time and, and I'm going to persevere. But the reason that I need to persevere is for the saving of the soul. It's not simply a list to go down and check these things off and say, I'm just doing great. No, there's a reason for this. There's a goal for this. There's a purpose for this. And Peter will get into that just a little later. But it's for the saving of the soul. If you've gotten to that point in your life when you're teetering back and forth and you're thinking about quitting... Please go back and review. How are you doing with the first items that Peter lists? How is your faith? Do you really believe God? Do you really believe His exceeding great and precious promises? Because there's also another goal to be reached here, and Peter says that is to take on divine nature. Our goal as Christians is not to see whether or not we can outdo the world, but to take on the nature of God. You say, Jesus was sinless. That should be our goal. That should be our aim. And you've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we move from perseverance to godliness. There is an order here. What is godliness? The Greek word that Peter used here is eusebia. The word God is not in it, but the word means piety. It means reverence. It means the utmost respect for the Almighty. So when we assemble, we assemble here to worship God. We assemble here to pray to God. We assemble here to sing to one another and to sing and make melody in our hearts to God. When I preach, I should be preaching to honor God. When I live tomorrow, I should be living a reverent, respectful life because of God and because of Jesus and who they are. That's what godliness is. The old phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, that's kind of a cute little cliche but that really doesn't, that doesn't bode well with what the word means. Has our nation lost respect and reverence for God? Will they influence us to defame and degrade His name? Yes, they will. And they were facing that. Because you see, when the Hebrews writer would say, look, you, you, there's only, you have to be careful because if you're not careful, you'll trod underfoot the Son of God if you reject Him. And there's no other sacrifice that can be offered. God is a holy God. Jesus being sinless is worthy of worship. He's worthy of honor. His name, who He is. But this is a, this is a fruit of my life, of your life, to be godly. A life of godliness. 
So does my life portray a reverent spirit toward God? How is my character among other people? Godliness is that which worships God. It honors Him. It would never put His name in any defamatory situation or structure, sentence structure. It would never do that. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Again, there's an order here. You ever wonder sometimes why some brethren are not kind to one another? They, they don't treat each other very nicely. And then you look at some person who, they're so kind to their brethren. They're so respectful and loving and caring. And if a brother needs something, that brother or sister is ready or willing to not just hold out a hand, but there's something in their hand. There's a help really being offered. And, and when somebody's really struggling, do uh, you think there could have been some struggling going on with some of these Christians and some of the persecutions against them? What some of these false teachers were saying, you know, over there in the third chapter, you know, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, the world's the same way it's always been. Jesus said he's coming back. He's not going to come back. And, and, and they, they had to deal with that. And, and, and somebody starts believing that. And, and the first thing they want to do is peck them on the head about it instead of saying, look, let's just sit down and talk about this. Let's see if we can't help one another. Because everybody gets caught up in something sometime, don't they? Kindness. Kindness. <coughs> Somebody lost their job because they held true to Christ. Brotherly kindness. They may need some physical assistance. Somebody's lost family members that fell away because of the persecution and the false teaching among the Jews. And they're alone. Some of us can stand alone. Very well. Most of us need somebody to help us. Brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. Do we not need a kind, loving, gentle brotherhood of people who really care about each other? Because it's so easy. Well, you didn't do that right. And let me show you how to pour. Could, could we sit down and look at this together and Consider this issue in light of God's word. You, kindness, gentleness. And you know what kind of people that comes from? That comes from people who have a life of moral excellence. That comes from people who have a life of knowledge. That comes from people who have self-control. That comes from people who have persevered and not given up. That comes from godly people. But then the capstone is love. It's not just brotherly kindness. What did Jesus say that to the two things that hung on the law and the prophets? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That's number one. And that's what a godly person does. But the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we catch those, we tie these things together in, in love. And I try to put the picture together here and I think, can I really love the way that I should love? I'm having trouble loving God. What's wrong here? I'm, I'm struggling. I don't think I love like I ought to. I, I think my love is weak and sometimes it's it doesn't even exist in some situations. Father, Father, what's wrong? I said, well, you may need to clean up something in your life. You may need to spend a, more, a little more time letting me speak to you about love. Because love is sacrificial on God's part. God has sacrificed on for, and done for us from the beginning of time. This world was not made for the animal kingdom. It was made for us. The animal kingdom was made for our enjoyment. 
the food that God, the seeds that he made for our food, <clears throat> the wonderful food, was a gift from God. And all the seasons and all the wonderful things and even when we do wrong, God sacrificed. He sacrificed his only son. That's the love of God. It's agape, A-G-A-P-E, agape. That's the highest level of love. The Greeks had four words for it. Agape was at the top. It's agape in John 3, 16. It's agape in Romans 5, verse 6. Verse 6. It's an action. Because the Bible says God is love. And I raised the question, well, how, how is my love? How would I measure it? And if I can't really measure it real high, maybe I need to go back and look at some of these fruits and say, well, which of these fruits is weak? Or which one of these fruit trees, the fruit tree of knowledge, is it barren? That fruit tree of perseverance, is it withering? Is there something lacking here? Am I really taking on a life of, of godliness? Because I look at this and I think, I can't really love my brethren if I'm not godly. I can't really love in its ultimate sense if I'm not godly. So I look at these particular verses and words that Peter uses here, and he says, and these qualities, if they're yours and they're increasing, notice we are to do this with all diligence. One of the reasons that certain, if a doctor puts you on a medical diet, a medical diet, this is what you must eat. Elisa's brother had a heart attack the other day, and he's been put on a special diet. He's diabetic. So Brent Wooders is going to have to eat differently. He will have to diligently do this or he can be sick again. I think about God's prescription for us. Do this with all diligence. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, I should grow in all of these areas. And they will, it says if they do, they will not render you useless or unfruitful. In the knowledge, in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to grow and mature. I want to be a strong Christian. I want God to see me as, as a son, you're doing great. And there's not an area in your life that's lacking. And I'm so glad to see. And, I, and you're pleasing me in what you're doing. And, and I'm increasing. But I do it for God's glory. But Peter says, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten something. He has forgotten the purification from his old sins. Isn't it amazing how everything you look at with regard to being a faithful Christian has its roots at the cross? Isn't it amazing how everything goes back to Calvary? And what took place at Calvary? Somebody says, well... They, they took Jesus after he'd been beaten and they put nails through his hands. Oh, they did. And they nailed him to a cross. Oh, yes, they did. And they took that cross and they stood it up and probably dropped it in a hole in the ground and he hung there for six hours. And Jesus suffered a horrible death. Yes, he did. But what did he accomplish when he did that? The purification of the purging of our sins. You see, if I fail to, to, to be, have these fruits in my life, I have forgotten that at one time, God, by Jesus' blood, when I went down to the waters of baptism, washed away every sin I've ever committed. Peter says, look, don't, don't forget that. You need to remember that. And he says in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. In other words, you have a choice in what you're going to do. The persecution was probably very heavy. The threats were probably very strong. And some of the arguments may have been very powerful, especially to a person who had not filled himself or herself with the knowledge of God. And he says, but 
make sure because it comes back to the same thing that the Hebrews writer says. This is a soul salvation issue. It's an issue of eternity. For as long as you practice these things, however, you will never stumble. Peter didn't say you'll never sin. The stumbling here is you'll never stumble to the point where you can't get back up again. You'll just keep growing. You'll not stumble. So I raised the question, well, do I stumble or am I growing? Do I struggle with my Christianity or do I see wonderful, precious fruit? Because ultimately, at the end of all of this, God has a promise and one of those magnificent and wonderful promises that he talked about earlier for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. I bring the lesson to this point. Somebody says, well, I don't care if I just get me a little bitty place, a little bitty stool to sit on and make it to heaven. Well, I don't guess that's so bad. But God wants to give you more than a little stool and a little corner to sit in in heaven. He wants it to be an abundant supply. All the wonderful and marvelous benefits that heaven has to offer. And if you make it, you're not going to just barely make it. You'll be all the way in there with all the wonderful benefits and blessings that God has to offer. So in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, supply knowledge. In your knowledge, supply self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, the greatest of all is love. This morning... Where do, you, where do you find yourself in this list? If you, you're here or you're here, are you struggling in some way? Are you a Christian? Have you done what the people on Pentecost did when they heard Peter preach to repent and be baptized? Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when they did that, the Lord added them to the church and they continued steadfastly. That's so important. That is so important, not only for them, but for us today. If there's some way that the Lord can help you this morning, you're struggling in any way, you bring that struggle to the cross and get that fruit healthy again in your life as we stand and as we sing.